Bless God. Amen. If I could, I just want to give a testimony. What brought me to this study with unity. Uh, foremost, I just bless God for this opportunity just to be able to stand before you. And my testimony, and I want to go ahead and just start with last year. April the 17th, 2016, when God allowed for me to be ordained by Pastor Bob. And from then, doors have been opening, okay? And when I say doors have been opening, um, some that prior I probably wouldn't want to walk into. But I really felt in my spirit that it was time for me to be ordained. And a lot of it had to do, well, Lord, maybe I need to um, get ready for this, or I'm still struggling with that, or this situation doesn't seem like it should be. But then I cannot do nothing without God, number one. And then I, with our studying, our teaching, God do for me what I cannot do for myself. So thank God for the ordination, and from there, yes, things have been happening. Doors have been opening and been quite busy. And when I say quite busy, between family and friends, gone on to be with the Lord, and starting with uh, Pastor Cannon, and being asked to do the committal. And then from there, um, my auntie, she went to be with the Lord. And prior to that, I'm at work, and this was on a Tuesday, and I just felt led in my spirit that right after I got off work that I needed to go down there and see her. And even though doing 12 hours, I just felt led to go down there to see her. But it's one thing when you're being led by the Spirit of God, he gives you that surge, he gives you that energy. And I was so happy that when I got down there and just to have that opportunity to talk with her, wanted to make sure that everything was well with her soul. And at that point, she was able to comprehend, but she could not talk. And she was weak, really weak. But, you know, God gives us wisdom. And I began talking to Auntie and said, Auntie, I'm here, and I just want to share with you. I just want to make sure that everything is well with your soul. And if you understand what I'm saying, I just want you to squeeze my hand. And as I began to ask her certain questions, and she went ahead and she just began to squeeze my hand. And that encouraged me. And I said, well, Auntie, I just want us just to go into a uh, going to a prayer, just a prayer of refreshing and renewal. And then she went ahead and she squeezed my hand again. And then we went ahead and we went through the prayer. And then after the prayer, I remember the doctor coming in and saying that I just needed to go ahead and check for the surgery that I did a couple of days ago. And I said, okay, that's fine. And as he went ahead and did what he needed to do, and then he told my auntie, he said, Ms. Williams, I'm going to go ahead and let you get back to having a good time with these ladies right now because I can tell you were having a good time. And then I asked the doctor, I said, excuse me, what did you say your name was? And he said it was Dr. Blessed. And I said, well, bless God. <laughs> that was even more encouragement, okay? So this happened on a Tuesday. Thursday, I still felt led to go down there to see her, and I went down there, and this time she was able to talk, and I was able to understand what she was saying, and uh, after that visit, on a Sunday morning after leaving here, got home, and I said, well, I'm going to go ahead and check on my dad, and then from there, I want to go and pay a visit to auntie. So while I was over there with my dad, and I said, okay, I'm going to go home, get a little nap, then I'll go see auntie. And right when the time I got up, to got, got to the back door, received the phone call saying, can you please come down as soon as possible? It was a turn for the worse. But when I got down there, 
and just remembering what took place on Tuesday and what took place on Thursday. And when I got into the waiting room, I looked around and I didn't see any of my family. I said, well, maybe I'm at another waiting room. Maybe there's somewhere else. So I just went ahead and sat down because the nurse said that the procedure that the doctors were doing at this point, it would last right at about 20 minutes. So I sat down and for about 20 minutes, I'm just going through my bag and the nurse comes in and she says, is there anyone here for Miss Maggie Bell Williams? And I said, yes, I am. So she went ahead and escorted me and she said, I want to let you know that her vitals are dropping and that the procedure didn't go as well as we had wanted it to go. So I just want to let you know what's going on. And I said, okay, that's fine. But when I got into the room, the nurse that was in the room at that particular time said that they wanted to give her oxygen, but she shook her head and said, no, she didn't want that. She was just ready just to go and be with the Lord. So just being able to be there to hold her hand and just to just rub her on her forehead was such a blessing and just the peace of God. And she went. She just went to be with the Lord. So with that said, my cousin, um, the son of my aunt, he asked if I would do the eulogy. And I told him, yes, that I would. So first eulogy, family member, but just the idea of the opportunity that God led me to be with her that Tuesday and then that Thursday and then that Sunday. I th it was just preparation, I really believe. So with that said, I agreed and said yes. And all kinds of things that I saw in the body of Christ in, in helping to help with the preparation as much as I could with the arrangements. And from this that I had to study, just seeing what I went through dealing with unity. And even in the body of Christ, naming Christ, there's still, there's, unfortunately, there's some disunity, okay? But nonetheless, I just thank God for the teaching and thank God for the spirit that want to just keep the main thing the main thing. And when I say that, that is the unity what God expects of me, regardless of what else might be going on in the midst of what I might be in in that moment, let me just walk out what I know as far as what the word says. So for that reason, I just wanted to study on unity. So with that said, amen. I wanna go ahead and just give a brief definition of the word unity. It says the state of being in full agreement a state or a fact of being united or combined into one as of the parts of a whole, unification, absent of diversity, unvaried or uniform character, a oneness of mind, feeling as among a number of persons, concord, harmony, or agreement the definition of unity, oneness. I want to go ahead and start by saying there is power in unity and there's also power in disunity. And I want us, if we could, to go to Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, familiar Bible story that I remember and you may have as well. And it's talking about the tower, the Tower of Babel. So I'm going to be reading it from the Amplified. And it says, Now the whole earth spoke one language and used the same words, vocabulary. And as people journeyed eastward, they found the plain in the land of Shinar. And they settled there. They said one to another, Come, let us make bricks and fire them thoroughly in a kill 
to harden and strengthen them. So they used brick for stone as building material, and they used tar, pyramid, asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build a city for ourselves and a tower whose top will reach into the heavens and let us make a famous name for ourselves so that we will not be scattered into separate groups and be dispersed over the surface of the earth, of the entire earth, as the Lord instructed. Now the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one, unified people, and they all have the same language. This is only the beginning of what they will do in rebellion against me. And now no evil thing they imagine they can do will be impossible for them. Come, let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, go down and there confuse and mix up their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the surface of the entire earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore the name of the city was Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the entire earth, and from that place the Lord scattered and dispersed them over the surface of all the earth. Verses 1 through 4, you see man's plan. And I just want to go ahead and just read the few notes that I have here. Verses 1 through 4, it said that man felt constrained to spread out over the earth. They felt by spreading out, they would lose their advantage they had gained of by spreading out. In other words, they were just comfortable right where they were. And then, when I talked about disunity, now, they came together wanting to build a tower to reach heaven. They were in unity, but it was a disunity. That was not God's original plan. But it just goes to show that when we take our focus over, over the, the, the purpose of a thing, that we can abuse it. And then I just started thinking, I said, now my husband, his trade is a masonry. Anything dealing with brick, he can just go ahead and he can put it together. And then I started thinking, I said, now out of all the contractors that he's a part of, what would it be if my husband said, okay, uh, Mr. Pinckney, Mr. Um, Solomon, we want to go ahead and let us come together so that we can go ahead and build this city or tower to heaven. Men trying to do something like that. But that's not God's original plan. It's not. Then we look and we see how man concluded. It said that man communicated the plan with one another and got the approval of one another. You want to go ahead and do this? Sure, I think it would be a good idea. Okay, join me. But that was not God, again, going back. What was the original purpose? Then it goes to say that they got the material to build the city, but the purpose that they had in mind that I might become famous, that I, look what I've done. They're taking their minds off of what God, but now they're focusing on what I can do. 
that can be trouble. Dr. Miles Monroe, and I wanted to quote the, uh, the late Dr. Miles Monroe, he quote, when purpose is not known, abuse is inedible, unquote. So if we don't know what the purpose of a thing, we can abuse it. Because Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, I'm going to get there with my notes. But it talks about the Great Commission. Matthew 28. And I want to say... Eighteen and nineteen. I thought I had it down there, but I don't. I'm sorry. Ah, thank you, Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter twenty-eight, verse, and I want to start at the eighteenth verse. Now Jesus approached, and breaking the silence, said to them all, said to them, all authority, all power of rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go then and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you all the days, perpetually, uniform, uniformly, and on every occasion to the very close and consummation of the age. Amen. So let it be. And then we look back what we just read in Genesis 11, 1 through 4, where they were just comfortable just staying right in one place. They didn't want to go ahead and move. They wanted to just stay there. But then we read here what the original purpose, he wants us to go out. He wants us to spread the gospel. He doesn't want us just to stay in just one and just be stubborn or not be able to share that gospel. But he wants us to go, to go forth. So when I saw that, and after reading what it says in Genesis, Chapter 6, where it says, And the Lord said, Behold, they are one, they are unified people, they all have the same language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do in a rebellion against me. And he doesn't want that. The power of unity. The power of unity could be used in a good way, and then you can also use unity in a bad way. But we, the people of God, we choose to want to use it the right way. We want to use it how God intended for us to do, the original. And that's when, I, when you see it here in Matthew 28, he wants us to go forth. He wants us to be able to carry that gospel, not just staying in one place, but he said, go ye therefore and make disciples. The power of unity, God way. In Matthew 18, 18 through 20, and this is from the New King James Version, it says, Surely I say to you that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So how we see that unity, we see that oneness, that when we can touch and agree, coming together and using in his name, not for selfishness, not for destruction, 
but we want to do it in a manner that's going to be to, to glorify God. Amen? Amen? So with that said, can we go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3? And it talks here about Christian unity and how it glorifies God. Ephesians 4 and 3. Make every effort to keep the oneness of the spirit in the bound of peace. Each individual working together to make the whole successful. So when I was sharing about that testimony, there was an incident where I needed to go ahead and meet with the director because of the arrangements. So when I got to the home, there, or should I say, on my way going to the home, going to the home, I received a phone call, and the other family member was just so frantic. They were uh, highly upset. So I just began praying and just trying to, to calm calm them down and then let them know that well I was gonna I'm on my way I'm in route I'm just in traffic so once I got there thank God that everything had it did calm down it was much better and we were still waiting for the director to come so once the director had gotten there and we were doing the order of service he said to me, once he, when he got there, he began asking, asking me questions. And when I be, shared with him, I said, well, this is my first funeral, so I am learning. I said, but if I don't know the answer, by all means, I will go ahead and try to find that answer for you. So just listening as he was talking, then he made mention about a covering. And he said to me, when we were doing the order of service, he said, well, who's going to do the committal? And I shared with him, I said, well, I have this individual to go ahead and do the committal for me. And then he made mention, he said, well, I can go ahead and cover you so I can do it. It won't be a problem. Well, I didn't, I didn't really feel that at all. I felt very uncomfortable with that. Because first thing was going through my mind, who are you? You don't know me like that. But I said, no, I don't think I need to, to say, say that. But I began, I, I calm my spirit, and I shared with him, I said, I didn't understand. And he said, well, because I'm an elder, and because in their organization, a woman would not be able. And at that point right there, I said, well, I, sir, I'll tell you what we will do. I said, I will go ahead and speak with the person who's going to be doing the committal. And I said that it, everything will, be, will work out just fine. So in other words, I was feeling it was a disunity. And some of the things that were being said in front of the family that was grieving, we didn't need to be discussing that at that time. I thought that we could just go ahead and go to maybe a private room and then we can just discuss that just one on one. So unity, I just wanted to keep the unity. So to make a long story short, everything worked out well. But just knowing who we are in Christ, and knowing that we should be that peacemaker and keeping the unity, oneness, harmony, especially when you're going through something that you're already in a lot of pain, there's a lot of grieving, we don't need to excite more. And especially for the body of Christ, for those who are unchurched, that's not a good example. It's not a good example at all. So. I like what it says in Ephesians 4 and 3. It says to make every effort to keep the oneness of the spirit in the bound of peace, each individual working together to make the whole successful. Now, sometimes it might be a little difficult because sometimes you may have that just 
seem that, uh, as Pastor Bob would say, you just want to send them to the moon sometime. But nonetheless, thank God for the Holy Spirit. And then sometimes just, just being quiet, spirit calming down, and allowing the spirit to, to talk to you, to speak to you. How does Paul, in the book of Ephesians, emphasize unity? Paul realized that if, Christ, if Christians are to continue cooperating in harmony, each of them must make an earnest effort to promote unity. God inspired Paul to write a letter to the Ephesians in which unity was a theme. Paul wrote about God's purpose to gather all things together again in Christ. He also likened Christians to the different stones that make up a building, the whole building being harmoniously joined together is growing into a holy temple for Jehovah. And just thinking back on the Tower of Babel, how was that going to bring God glory when they were saying, let us do this? You know, we're able to do this of ourselves. We don't need God. Getting all puffed up. I've heard some that say, oh, I don't take all that. Well, you're right, it doesn't take all that, but it does take the truth, which is the word of God. And if we follow the, the truth, the word of God, the way he originally intended for, for us to do, then it would not at all be that struggle. Then it goes on, it says that furthermore, Paul highlighted the unity of Jewish and Gentile Christians and also reminded the brothers of their common origin. He referred to Jehovah as the father to whom every family in heaven and on earth owes its name. Every family in heaven and on earth owes his name. Without him, we can do absolutely nothing. But with him, all things are possible. And just that unity. The enemy, we know he wants to always, there's always going to be something. He's always going to be putting in that distraction. But thank God for his word. His word is eternal. His word is life. Why oneness requires an earnest effort. Why is it that we have to put forth that effort for unity? Paul entreated his Ephesian brothers to endeavor to observe the oneness of the spirit, to understand the need for the effort in this regard. Consider the case of God's angels. No two living things on earth are completely alike. So we can reasonably conclude that Jehovah has blessed each one of his millions of angels with a uniqueness. Everyone here, we all have our special gifts. As you know, Pastor Bob shared, we all have our, our special gift. You know, and we know that the scripture let us know he gives some to be apostles and teachers and evangelists and on. But then at the same token, all have that special gift. That might be that special gift just to encourage someone, to edify someone. To be able to say, well, I can help you do this. That's a gift. And that's, those are gifts that are, are highly needed. A lot of times you say, well, I can't sing or I can't pray the way that that. No. Just being able to utilize what God has gifted you to do could be a blessing for someone that you, you might meet out there in the street or something or coming in here and just being able to be that blessing. I, I've often said I don't despise small beginnings. Not at all. I do not despise small beginnings because in that small beginnings, if God is in it, he can multiply it. He can multiply it. What attitudes will help us to enjoy cooperating with our brothers who have defects different from, from ours? When imperfect people try to cooperate, 
they can easily have difficulties. For example, what if a mild-tempered brother who often arrives late serves Jehovah along with a brother who is punctual but easily loses his temper? So I'm on time. The brother who comes in might be late, but now you're going to cop an attitude because, so again, you know, we are CIP. We're continually in process. We are work in process. It says, each might feel that the other's conduct is lacking something, but might forget that aspect of his own conduct are equally inappropriate. How could two such brothers serve together in harmony attitude? And this is what Paul wrote. He said, entreat you to walk worthily with complete lowliness of mind and mildness with long suffering, putting up with one another in love, earnestly endeavoring to observe the oneness of the spirit in the uniting bond of peace, that oneness, walking in love, walking in harmony. And again, this is, I'm sorry, this is, we're still in the book of Ephesians, okay? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6. Now we want to look at why is it vital to work towards being united with other imperfect Christians. In verse 7, it says, learning to serve God in unity with other imperfect people is vital because there is only one body of true worshipers. When we worship, we worship in truth and in spirit. It says, one body there is and one spirit, even as you were called in the one hope to which you were called. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One God and Father of all persons. Jehovah's spirit and blessings are linked to the one association of brothers that God is using. Even if someone in the congregation upsets us, where else can we turn? Nowhere else can we hear the sayings of the everlasting life. Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Gifts that are in men will promote the unity. What does, what does Christ use to help strengthen us against this divisive influences? Paul used a common practice among soldiers of ancient times to illustrate how Jesus had provided gifts in men to help unify the congregation. A victorious soldier might bring a foreign captive home as a slave to provide his wife help with the chores. Similarly, Jesus' victory over the world provided him with many willing slaves. How did he used those captives, so to speak. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as shepherds and teachers with a view to the readjustment of the holy ones for the ministerial work, for building up the body of Christ until we all obtain to the oneness in the faith by helping each other by being our brother's keeper, that oneness and that unity, bringing, bringing in the unity. Ephesians 4.13, it says, until we all reach a oneness in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, growing spiritually to become a mature believer, reaching to the measure of the fullness of Christ, manifesting his spiritual completeness and exercising our spiritual gifts in unity. And as I said earlier, those spiritual gifts, those you, he's made us all to be unique. And you have that special 
gifting that God has given unto each one of us to encourage. We are the body of Christ. So that little situation that I shared about earlier, being in that atmosphere, I didn't want to tear down the body of Christ. And I would have done that if I had stepped out and just, okay, I'm not, I'm not liking what you're saying and choose to walk in the flesh. But wanting to be that God would be glorified and to be an example. And sometimes it just takes just absolutely being quiet sometimes. Ephesians 4, 14 through 16. So that we are no longer children, spiritually immature, being tossed back and forth like ships on a stormy sea and carried about by every wind of shifting or doctrine, by the cunning and trickery of unscrupulous men, by the deceitful scheming of people, ready to do anything for a personal profit, but speaking the truth in love in all things, both our speech and our lives, expressing his truth. Let us grow up in all things into him, following his example, who is the head, Christ. From him, the whole body, the church, in all its various parts. We're all together. We can still be able to maintain that peace and that harmony and not getting upset or feeling jealous or strife or envy over another brother or sister. I look at it as, you know, it's a blessing to me because what I may not be able to do I've got my brother or my sister, or I know of someone that I can go ahead and lead that person to help in that situation and not feeling all puffed up and say, no, I want to do it all. Because if you try to do it all, I've been there, done that, it doesn't work. You'll get burned out pretty quickly. The 16th, from him the whole body, the church, and all his various parts join and knitly firm together by what every joint supplies with each part is working properly. It causes the body to grow and mature, building itself up in unselfish love. How to cultivate new attitudes. How can immoral conduct threaten our unity? Ephesians. And this is at the 10th verse. I have it marked as 10 and I'm. Practicing love is the key to obtaining unity as a mature Christian. It shows that, it shows what love involves. And when we know that if we are able to walk in love, the Bible says that love will cover a multitude of sin, a multitude of sin. So not being able to when you're trying to do it of yourself, then it's going to be a problem. It'll be difficult. But when we allow the Holy Spirit, we allow God, just say, Father, I need you to, to work in me, to help. I had an incident that took place at work, and this was about, about a month ago. And this involved one of my setups. And, but that's just his personality. His personality is somewhat, can sometimes be a little condescending. And sometimes we, you know, we kind of joke and play around and that such. But this one particular day, it just got a little bit too far. And 
I went ahead and said, well, I think 1 Peter 3, 8, 9 is going to work right now. So I began just blessing and blessing and blessing. So we had one of our co-workers that had to leave early. So it was just the two of us. So with that said, it just put more work on, on each one of us because, again, he was a setup. He needed to take care of the machines while I was trying to do um, the other things as far as maintaining. But he said something, and I know that I had already taken care of that particular machine. And before I knew it, I said, I think what we need to do, we need to go ahead and have a talk with our FLM. And he was saying, have a talk with the FLM? I said, yeah. He said, oh no, he said, it's only gonna make you look bad. I said, no, it's not gonna make me look bad, but we need to have a talk. <laughs> so long story short, I went ahead and I um, called the FLM and I told him that we needed to come together and have a little short meeting. So he asked me, well, what happened? And I went ahead and I shared with him what had happened. So when he came on the floor, he said, well, I need to see both of you in the office. So we went into the office and I, he went ahead and he shared his side and I had an opportunity to share my side. And long story short, that when we walked out of there, or should I say prior to us walking out of there, our FLM instructed us, he said, now this meeting was between just the three of us. Once you get back on the outside, on the shop floor, no one will know nothing unless you decide to say something. So I would, just for a suggestion, just to keep this among the three of us. And I said, okay, that's fine. But we were able to talk and we were able to come to an agreement and an understanding because apparently he didn't understand um, my terminology and he, he's, he was, uh, he speaks German and nothing against you brother, <laughs> okay? Nothing at all, nothing at all, okay? But some of our synonyms mean different, okay? So with that said, we resolved that issue. So when we walked out, and I'm being honest, it, it just still felt, because I, I like walking in peace and sometimes things happen. And I said, wow, I've been here for 32 years, and this is only the second time in my mind that I literally had to go and say, FLM, we need to talk. But nonetheless, we did that. But unity, oneness, peace, we got to work together. We got to be professional. So when we were walking back on the shop floor, he said, Doris, he said, everything is fine. I said, yep, everything is going to be just fine. So he said, well, I tell you what, we're going to show them that we were able to resolve this. So he gives me a hug. I give him a hug. And we walk back on the shop floor holding hands. Can you believe that? Holding hands, right? <laughs> but the unity, the unity, it is so important. And not only that, I had to set the example. I had to be the example. So it all worked out. It, it did. It all worked out. And the forgiveness, yeah, 1 Peter 3, 8, 9, the forgiveness, exactly, exactly. I want to go ahead and close out. I just got two more, well, three more scriptures. But I want to read this. The Bible encourages Christians to make what change? Whatever change in the situation, what I just shared in reference for my coworker. I didn't want that to continue and then it'll fester and then maybe two weeks later he may say something and snap, okay? Well, I might snap or he might snap and I didn't want that. So I said, well, you know what? The best thing for me to do, let's talk about this. Let's just get the FLM involved 
everyone's hearing the same thing at the same time, and let's have peace, have unity. The Bible encouraged Christians to make a change. Paul stressed that we should drop disrupt those ways of thinking, and instead cultivate attitudes that enable us to live in harmony with others. He said you should put away the old personality which conforms to your former course of conduct and which is being corrupted according to the old personality or deceptive desires. You should be made new in the force or in your mind and should put on a new personality which was created according to God's will in true righteousness and loyalty. How can we be made new in the force actuating our mind? If we appreciatively compliment what we learn both from God's word and from the fine example of a mature Christian with the effort we can acquire the new personality created according to God's will. In my closing, these three scriptures, Galatians 3.13, and this is from the NIV version, but it says to bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. In Psalm 133 and 1, again, I'm reading from the NIV, but it says how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And the last, Ephesians 1 and 10, to be put into effort when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And that was just a demonstration as far as unity, the power of unity. It can be used for the good, and it can also be used for the bad. But as saints of God, we want to bring God glory. So we choose, we make a conscious decision that we want to walk in unity and walk in love. Amen.